Okay, so I now call this house to order and I call upon the Honorable Prime Minister, Tim Willikin, to give a 17 minute introduction. Thank you very, very much, Madam Speaker. All the members of the panel, everybody involved in running this tournament, Brian and I have certainly had a great time this weekend, and the August House, everybody who stayed this far. Now, you're probably all thinking that this is going to be like the Battle of the Bulge with regard to con law minutia, that, you know, we know a lot about con law, they know a lot about con law. I know I'm going to be disappointing a lot of you when I tell you that you're going to be running a case that has absolutely nothing to do with the <laughs> set up a little bit of a thought experiment for you, and it's sort of a moral thought experiment. The, the construct for this is a little, <laughs> is a little bit complicated. If you have any clarifications, you know, please answer. The situation is this. There's four explorers exploring in a cave. The cave caves in. They have, they have air and they have water, but they know that by the time help arrives to dig them out, they will have starved to death. We're just going to posit that they know this. So what these four explorers decide to do is they decide to have a drawing of straws. And whoever draws the short straw, they will kill that individual and they will eat that individual. Yeah. All four explorers agree to this. So they, before, right before they're going to have the drawing, one of the explorers, we'll call him Mike, decides that he does not want to participate in the drawing. He just wants to go off into the corner and die by himself. The other explorers say, no, 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 you can't do this. So what they decide to do is they draw a straw for him. And we're also going to posit that we know that they had a fair drawing, but that Mike's straw was the short straw. They killed him, and then they eat him. Well, where you come into this round, Madam Speaker, is you are a juror. We're going to say you're a juror in the United States. And these other three explorers are brought on trial before you for murder. Um, basically, what the prosecution has said is, listen, they killed this person against his will. That's murder. The defense has said, no, this was self-defense. And you have to decide whether or not you want to vote to convict or acquit these explorers. Which is it going to be? OK. We are giving, going to give you three reasons why you should acquit these three explorers. The first has to do with the idea that their action was morally permissible. And we're going to give you a bunch of moral standpoints you can look at this action from. The first is a utilitarian standpoint. And I think this is fairly clear, right? If Mike gets his way, these three people have to have a drawing, and one of them dies. In addition, Mike's going to starve to death, so he dies. This means two people die. Whereas if they draw a straw for Mike, they enter into a system where only one person has to die. Clearly, if you're a utilitarian, you have to think that that's a better plan. Now, Madam On Speaker, that point, sure. So it's utilitarian to not let Mike die, even though that's the choice that he's made for himself. That's what we should be upholding. Yes, right. Because if we acknowledge Mike's choice, that means we have to kill somebody else against their will. It's not as if these other explorers want to die. It's that they're willing to take the chance of dying because otherwise they're all going to die. Now, Madam Speaker, maybe you're not a utilitarian. I'm not either. But if we're trying to consider the motivations of these three explorers in the cave, all we have to think about is whether or not they had some sort of legitimate moral justification. Maybe they were utilitarians, and if they were, they would have thought that this was the right thing to do. The second sort of moral standpoint we're going to give you for looking at this is a social contractarian standpoint. Now you might all be saying, well, the social contract, that just deals with governments. These four people aren't a government. Well, OK, it's true that they're not a government in the sense that they don't print stamps or build roads. But what we think the social contract thought experiment is about is about the use of force, and when you are justified and when you are not justified in coercing other people. What we're going to say is that these three other explorers were essentially a body that had more force than Mike. They could coerce him to do something. The question is whether or not they were justified in coercing him to take part in this drawing. What we are going to say is that if a hypothetical, rational individual would agree to a certain set of laws, a more powerful body is justified in coercing everybody to follow those set of laws. Sure, not everybody always has the same beliefs, but insofar as we can imagine a rational individual agreeing to these set of laws, these explorers are perfectly justified in enforcing these laws, even if that means using coercion some of the time. Just because a particular individual doesn't necessarily want to participate in the laws doesn't morally justify him opting out. I'm sure we can all imagine, like, you know, pedophiles who would want to say, well, I don't want to take part in the United States law. I want to live outside of the law and, like, molest little boys all I want. Well, the way the social contract works is you can't do that. Everybody has to follow a set of laws that, like, a hypothetical rational individual would agree to. Next thing I'm going to talk about under this moral justification is just the idea of preservation of life. Some people believe that life is fundamentally sacred and it's wrong to take life. And fairly clearly, under Mike's plan, if Mike had had his way, two people would have died under the plan these explorers in, like, in enacted, only one person died, so it's just better on that standpoint. The final moral just thing we're going to talk about in this moral permissibility is that the fact that they had a fair drawing indicates that these four explorers were trying to do the right thing, or these three explorers were trying to do the right thing. We can, after the fact, question whether or not they did the right thing. We think it's to some extent an open sort of philosophical question. But we don't think that's the sort of thing that necessarily needs to be decided in a court of law, right? We think that the relevant legal thing is that they were at least trying to do the right thing. We can nitpick and say maybe they did or maybe they did not, but these guys could have very easily just ganged up on Mike when he backed out of the deal. 
Three of them could have just forced him down and killed him and eaten him right there without having a drawing. The fact that they had a drawing shows that they were concerned about fairness. They were trying to do the right thing. The next thing we're going to talk about is how this is legally permissible. Essentially, how this does constitute self-defense. Now, I'm sure that you're going to get up here and say that Mike was not acting maliciously, so killing him wasn't self-defense. What we are going to say is that malice isn't necessary for self-defense. That some sort of reckless endangerment or gross negligence is enough, right? Mike's actions endangered the lives of these people. He significantly increased the chances by like, going off into the corner by himself that these other individuals would die, would be killed, or would starve to death. In that sense, he was endangering those, their lives through his actions. At that point, these people are justified in killing him, legally speaking, even though he was not malicious. And this sort of experiment I want to like, point out about why this is true, is you can imagine if you were in like, a tunnel, a one-lane tunnel, and a drunk driver was driving at you in a car, and your two options were to be killed by that drunk driver, or to shoot him, like, we'll say you had a gun, or to shoot him and stop him, thus preserving your own life. That drunk driver may not have been malicious. He might not have even known you were there because he was so drunk. But we'd all agree that killing a driver in that situation is a sort of justifiable act of self-defense. The final thing I want to talk about is how sending these people to jail serves no purpose. Because again, I'm sure they're going to give us some philosophical arguments about why what these explorers did wasn't good. But it's important to remember that this isn't a case about going back in time and changing what these explorers did. Ultimately, the only power you have as a juror is to choose to send these people to jail or to choose not to send them to jail. What we're going to say is that there is no purpose of sending them to jail. So what are the four reasons that sometimes apply for sending people to jail? Indirect deterrence, direct deterrence, reform, and retribution. We're going to go through them one by one and show how none of them apply in this case. Well, first of all, indirect deterrence. The idea that by punishing a certain action in a particular case, you deter other people from doing the action in other cases. We're going to say that there's going to be no deterrent here, right? Even if future people are in a cave in a situation like this, where they need to either take somebody's life or risk losing their own life, they're still going to take the other person's life, right? Because otherwise, they're going to die. So the threat of jail isn't going to be very significant to them. The second thing is direct deterrence. The idea that like, if you put a thief in jail, he just can't steal from anybody anymore. What we're going to say is that these four explorers aren't necessarily like hardened criminals. They're people that try to do the right thing. Moreover, I'm going to wager that they're probably going to stay out of caves in the near future. <laughs> they're just that sort of bad experience. I don't think we need to be concerned with that. The next thing is the idea of reform. But again, we see that these people aren't hardened criminals. Moreover, these are people that, when their life were on the line, held a fair drawing. Pretty clearly, they were risking their lives to try to do the right thing. Risking their lives to try to be fair. We don't think these sorts of people are a pariah on society. The final idea is retribution. Essentially the idea that somebody did something that was just so wrong that it's just the right thing to do to punish them. Again, these people tried to do the right thing. Maybe they're going to get up here and give you some arguments why they're wrong. Maybe some of your philosophy majors can like quibble with the utilitarianism as a principle. But so long as these people were trying to do the right thing, operating under a moral principle, we don't think we should punish them for that. Sending them to jail will ruin these people's lives. It will ruin their families' lives. It will cost society money. If it does no good, we see no reason to send them to jail. We're proud to promote that. Right? I thank the Prime Minister, and I now call upon the Honorable Leader of Opposition, David Cooper, to give a speech constructing the opposition philosophy. Thank you, Madam Speaker, the panel, the House, Julio, for running what I thought is an excellent tournament. Side off, Milan. Okay, I'm going to go straight into it. The first thing that seemed very, very strange to me is that they said, well, if someone tries to do the right thing and operates by a moral principle, then you can't find them guilty. <laughs> that is the weirdest thing I have yet heard in this country. I've heard a lot of weird things. Okay, that's just kind of a general point. Keep that in mind. This is bizarre. The, the first independent point I have, and those of you who saw my semi-final run, I apologize because I gave this exact same point then, which is this. A juror's job is to follow the law. Okay, they're saying your job is to determine whether or not utilitarianism or like, you know, some kind of metaphysical Kantianism is better. <laughs> you're a freaking juror. Like, you're probably not that smart. Even if you are that smart, like, I don't know that which one is better either. I, I don't know if Brian does, but like, I certainly don't. I certainly wouldn't want to put any particular juror in the position of deciding which philosophy overall is best. We think that's a real problem. What we do think they should do is what they said they would do when they took an oath, which is to follow the law. The law says this is not self-defense. They say, well, it's a kind of self-defense. No, no. You don't determine what self-defense is. The law determines what self-defense is. And this simply doesn't fall under that category. Whether or not you think that category is right, I frankly don't care. It's not your job. 
The second independent, I want to talk, independent point I want to talk about is just something kind of weird in their case, again, which is that why should the draw have mattered at all, right? Because if you believe the points they give you in terms of if you know, self-defense is okay, it's okay to kill one in order to like, you know, benefit them all, then why do they even have to do a draw, right? Why couldn't they have just killed them without doing a draw? And then that would have been equally more impermissible. I think that the intuitive response to that is, well, that's just wrong. Well, then they have to show a distinction why that's just wrong, but doing the draw is not just wrong. Especially when that draw does not include someone entering the draw. In other words, <laughs> isn't it true that we think a draw is okay when you agree to be in the draw? Like, I've never heard this kind of thing where, oh, it's a draw, so it's okay. Like, what if I, like, spun a wheel and determined whether or not, like, I punched you, right? <laughs> if, you, if, like, if you agree to that, then, like, fantastic. But, like, if I, like, well, I'll just put Jordan's name on the wheel for half of it, Shh, don't tell anyone, like, I think something will be a problem. Maybe some would be. <laughs> the third point I want to talk about is this idea that even if let's say you want to talk about philosophy a lot, let's say you're like a, the juror philosopher, we're going to say, we're going to, the, what we're going to say is that this kind of calculus is not okay. They have to distinguish between this case, and I'm sorry for people in semifinals and, and who've seen this stuff before, but between this case and kind of organ donation, ca organ cases where, for example, I kill you, spread out your ten organs among ten people, and yay, more people are alive. We generally say that that's not okay. In other words, just because someone is going to die at some kind of like future date doesn't mean that you can then kill them. In other words, like, let's say you've survived this case for like a month. Would that mean that you can't kill them? How about a year? How about 20 years? Maybe you're, it's cast away. I don't know. But the point is that they certainly have to draw a distinction between this type of case and all those other types of cases where we say murder is wrong even if it produces socially beneficial effects. Now I'm going to go to case. And the first thing that they talk about is, listen, this utilitarian justification. First of all, like even if you believe this, why don't they draw among themselves, right? In other words, if these people really thought that the draw was so important and just you know better to keep some them someone alive, why didn't they do that? Certainly the overall utilitarian, not for the individual, but utilitarianism means maximize utility among all people. If that's true, there's no reason that you should include that person in the draw if that person doesn't want to be. Secondly, they have to show why utilitarianism is right, especially in cases where we generally think it's wrong, like you know, killing someone, because we generally think people have a right to life. The next thing that they talk about as they say, listen, they make the, any legitimate justification is enough. Why is any legitimate justification enough? In other words, maybe like the person I killed is a real bastard. Do you think that's a justification enough? They say any legitimate justification. I want to know how they define legitimate. I don't define it by saving my ass. I don't think that's a legitimate justification. The next thing they talk about is the social contract. They say if a rational person would agree to it, then you have to go along. I don't think a rational person would necessarily agree to this deal. First, some people are morally opposed to murder, I being one of them. I don't think that's irrational. I think it actually makes a whole lot of sense. In other words, even if it would benefit me to like enter in this deal because I'll die anyway, it doesn't mean that I necessarily would because I might find it morally wrong to enter into a deal which necessarily means that I might have to kill someone. We think that, that that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. The next thing they talk about is preservation of life. But does preservation of life mean maximize the most number of people alive or don't commit an affirmative action which can kill someone? We say it's the latter. We say it's the latter for a whole lot of reasons. Like first, people have a right to life. Second, like they, their people have a right to choice. Obviously not in this case, right? Both of those rights were you know, not taken into consideration at all. The second thing that they talk about is the person was trying to do the right thing. What does that mean that they're trying to do the right thing? First, they have to prove that it was the right thing or that or that the person thought that it was the right thing. I'm not sure what it means. In other words, does it mean that the person approximated the right thing? If that's true, then it begs the question of whether or not it was right, but it also kind of questions whether or not it matters why that person, you know, what, why it was right. Maybe they actually mean that the individual person, that was their conception of morality. Do we really want to go around saying, listen, if that's your conception of morality, that's fine. Like maybe Jeffrey Dahmer's conception of morality is this. I like killing people, therefore it is good to kill people, therefore don't find me guilty for killing people. Like, I don't know, but to go along with the individual person's morality as opposed to the law doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense, especially for you, Mr. Durer, philosopher. The third point that they talk about is self-defense. They say that, First of all, the self-defense point, again, go back to the Oregon point, obviously we could maximize more lives by committing affirmative harms to people. We don't do it. We believe that people have rights. But he says something very interesting here, which is reckless endangerment. You're, that person was recklessly endangering your life. I thought, reckless, I thought the key was recklessly endangering your life. I think it was the person who was recklessly endangering your life. He didn't do anything to you. Like, unless he somehow, like, well, what's going on in this cave? And there was a support. He's like, what? Go over here. <laughs> Maybe then he recklessly endangered your life. 
bar and back. Please don't say that. Like, obviously, there's no reckless endangerment involved. Reckless endangerment involves some kind of action by the person, or at least some negligence or something like, you know, he should have been obligated to do. The last thing they talk about is when you send pe sending people to jail serves no purpose. And they give this whole bunch of things. First, to think under deterrence, they say, hey, you know, people will still do it. But I'm not so sure that's true. Will they still necessarily include the person who didn't want to be in the poll? Because they could have not done that and at least had a chance of living. Secondly, once you kind of set a precedent like this, it's hard to know where to draw the line. In other words, you don't know in similar situations where maybe someone's not sure when they're going to be rescued, maybe then they'll think that that's okay to kill men. I don't think that they agree with that, but certainly a person who sees this kind of verdict might get that impression. Then the idea of direct deterrence. They say, listen, you don't need to incapacitate these people. They were just in a weird situation. First, they've got the taste of meat. Understand right now. <laughs> <laughs> they are a real danger. <laughs> was a fair drawing. Again, a fair drawing is generally one that's entered into, not one that like force you to be in. The last thing I talk about is retribution, and, un and I think this is really why, for the most part, we say, well, aside from the fact that you should follow the law, that you should punish the person. In other words, what we say is it was wrong what they did. What we're saying is that people do have rights, and just to save your own ass is not a legitimate justification. For all these reasons, we're proud to oppose. <laughs> I thank the Leader of Opposition, now call upon the Honorable Member of Government, Brian Fletcher, to give another speech on the uh, government. Thank you very, very much, Madam Speaker. All the members of the panel in this most august house, Tim, for an excellent case, and I'm sure a great PMR, and our friends on South Opposite, for it's a very good op so far, and I expect it to continue. I want to start right where Dave starts, because he stands up and he says, they said something real stupid. And the way he put it, 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 it sounds real stupid. You, you meant stupid. I know. It's okay. I'm not offended, but you meant stupid. Because what that construes our case to be is that as long as it's okay with you, it's okay with everybody. Yes, that would be very stupid. That's not what Tim's saying at all, right? Tim's not saying Jeffrey Dahmer has this set of morality. He was acting according to his set of morality, so that's okay. Instead, what Tim is saying is this is a very difficult moral question. Like, philosophers write about this, and it's interesting to debate about precisely because it is a very difficult moral question. Whether or not it's okay to kill and eat little boys while sexually molesting them, Jeffrey Dahmer's choice, not an open question in society. We're all relatively certain that that's not cool, right? But on this particular case, it's a very hard case. And what we're going to argue is that where you can hold people responsible, for doing the moral thing, when the moral thing is very obvious to everybody, right? When you have a hard case of morality, what's important is not necessarily whether the person got it right, because this is a very rare case. I'm going to argue later why the law isn't designed to deal with cases like this. Instead, what Tim's saying is that we should judge them more lightly, because at least they made the attempt to do the moral thing, and they didn't act out of the self-interest. And before I take Alon's point, I want to point out something else, because they talk a lot about how this is, we have to follow the law. The law is very important. One element of murder in the law is whether you acted with malice, right? We're going to argue these individuals were not acting with malice precisely because they tried to do the right thing. They didn't act out of craven self-interest. They weren't trying to hurt Mike. They did it simply because they did a fair drawing they thought was the moral thing to do. I'm sorry, you still have a question. I've forgotten to ask something. Sure. Were they acting with malice after the draw was done? I don't think so, no. Like, I, I don't think, like, if you're in a cave with your four friends, right, and one of them loses a draw, and you know that the only way that the other three of you are going to survive is if you kill and eat him, you're not going to be dancing on his grave, right? This isn't fun for these people to do, right? It's something very difficult for them to do. But the first real independent point that we get from them is this notion of, you're jurors, it's your job to follow the law. And I assume, from the way that he says this, that he assumes that because he gave analysis about it in semifinals, he's given analysis to everyone in finals. Now, for those of you who heard about it in semis, maybe you're applying all that analysis, but I'm unclear as to why why it is that he can stand up and say, you're a jury, your job is to follow the law, and we're supposed to take that as gospel, right? I have a number of problems with that. First of all, I think if we can show that this is an open legal question, that there is room for di dispute about whether or not this is something, then this argument doesn't matter. But second of all, I'm going to argue that the law wasn't designed for these circumstances. It's not like when we drafted the statute against murder, the legislators considered on the floor, what if four guys get stuck in a cave and the only way for them to live is to kill one of the guys, right? This is a very rare case. And I'm going to argue that if it's ever okay for jurors to deviate from the law, it is in cases where clearly the law was not designed for this particular case. Right. Sure. Do we really want individual jur jurors making the determination of when it is that the law was or wasn't supposed to be applied? Outstanding. Right. So we have a problem. You take it to the extreme, jurors are like, screw it, I'm never going to pay any attention to the law, you have anarchy. You take your side to the extreme, when jurors follow the law no matter what, you have jurors convicting people when laws are horrifically unjust. You have like straight legal positivism, which says uh, you as a juror, even if something is horribly, horribly wrong, must follow the law because that's what the law says and the law is not, right? Either extreme is unappealing. We're going to have to find some sort of a position in the middle. 
The third argument I want to make is the notion of your moral duties. Like, as a moral agent, as a juror, I think equal to your obligation to the law is your obligation to yourself, is not to vote against something that you hold as a fundamental moral conviction. I think that's an argument that jurors make very often. And in some states, even like I think Maryland and one other, and I know this because I love con law so much, there are specific provisions saying if jurors have moral problems with the law, they're allowed to nullify the law. So sometimes even the law recognizes that you don't have to just follow the law as a juror. And the last argument I want to note is simply that, uh, actually that's all, my aunt gave the other one in response to his point. The second argument they give us is this notion of, well, why, you know, they say if the drawing makes it okay, why can just draw a distinction between having the drawing and just killing him without having the drawing? And I don't understand why they make this a constructive point for them. I think it's very easy to see, right? Like, the fact that you had a drawing meant that you gave all of you an equal chance of being the one who suffered this inevitable harm, right? If you just killed one of them, it would have been totally unfair because only one of you would have had a chance of dying, right? It's not like we just for fun decided to spin a wheel to punch somebody and put, like, one person's name disproportionately on it, which is both unnecessary and unfair. Here, the only way that anyone was going to survive was if someone died. So it was necessary, distinction number one. And two, they went out of their way to do it in the fairest way possible. But well, Brian, we, sure. why don't you just then choose the weakest person? That'll overall maximize utility, right? No, not at all. That's not a good argument. And even though Carl Ralston is a smart person, there's a reason why she's the only one clapping for that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like uh, you, she is a smart person, but in this particular case, you're wrong. I'm sorry. Right? Like, survival of the fittest may generally work, but here you are four people. Like we say, stipulated into the case, three of you will survive if you kill and eat the other one. None of you will survive otherwise. There's no reason to say just because you're the weakest, we should screw you, right? You should respect everyone equally and be fair within those constraints. Then he talks about the organs case, and he, he gives us what I, we expected, right? He says, look, if this were justified, it would be okay to run around killing people, taking their organs, doing whatever we can do to maximize utility. And I don't think that's the case, right? First of all, I think with respect to this case, you know certainly that all of you are going to die. There's no time that you have certainty like that in organ transplants, in other cases like that, in normal conditions in society, right? But secondly, we're going to argue that this thing that these people did actually made Mike, the guy who ended up dying, better off. And I know that sounds like a messed up claim to make, since he did, after all, end up dead, and they're trying him for his murder. But think about it. One way, Mike had a 100% chance of dying if no drawing was held, if you did what the law, they say the law requires you to do. The way that they chose to do things, everyone actually had a 25% chance of living. So it may have ended up that Mike died in the long run, but you actually gave him a chance of living that he would not have otherwise had. Things didn't work out for him, but I think you did make him objectively better off by giving him that chance. Let's look back at case. And the first argument we have is this notion of moral permissibility. And the first response that we get, you know, is this notion of, well, why is it that, you know, we have to respect anybody's moral norms? Jeffrey Dahmer's moral norms are bad. I've already dealt with that. Then they get to our social contract argument. They make an interesting argument. They say, look, a rational person might not always agree with the, so the laws that they're set up. Okay, but this is twisting social contract theory a little bit, right? A rational person might not always agree with the laws of the United States as they're currently set up. I might disagree with them, something like that. That doesn't mean that the social contract or this notion of abstract consent doesn't apply to the United States, right? What we're arguing is simply this. If a rational person acting in their own self-interest, not considering what else might be right, what else might be wrong, would agree to do this because it was beneficial to them, then it's okay. Then this is a reasonable standard to use for force. You can't possibly have something that would satisfy everybody, right? People have different views about morality. If you had to have something that would satisfy every rational being with every possible pre-existing moral notion, you'd never be able to justify the use of force ever for any government. The only standard that we have that we actually can apply is this notion of would a rational person acting in their own self-interest choose to do this? You're out of order, and they also don't provide you with any analysis as to why this isn't in someone's rational self-interest. They say you could have pre-existing moral objections to this, but when we realize that those don't come into play when you're considering the social contract, they're pretty much stuck with the notion that this is something that people would consent to because it does make them all better off. The next argument that we get is this notion of legal permissibility, and this is going to be important to them. They say, look, it's not like reckless endangerment. And first of all, I find it a little bit problematic that like where Harvard breaks out the funny is in response to the argument that they think is most important, right? The only response that we get to this notion of reckless endangerment is, well, don't tell us that he's like knocking over the cave and stuff like that. That's not what's happening. Well, what Tim stood up and said was, Mike's actions, his inactions, whatever spin you want to put on it, are putting you at a substantially greater risk of death. That's just true. He's choosing to renege his consent to this drawing. Well, if that's the case, he is in danger of your life. Now, if it were true that you could only have reckless endangerment by action, fine. But I think you can also have reckless endangerment. You can also have negligence through careless inaction, right? Like, if I'm someone who doesn't you know, set the parking brake on my car, I do something stupid like that, and that's why you're about to die, under the law, that's still negligence. Inactions can endanger lives as well, and at the point that they accept the notion that reckless endangerment justifies force and self-defense, reckless endangerment can also happen because of people's irresponsible inactions. 
Let's look at the third argument. We give you this notion of the purpose of jail. And the first thing Tim talks about is indirect deterrence. And they say, well, people might be inclined not to include other people in the future. They might, you know, where are we going to draw the line, things like that. I have two simple responses. First of all, cases like this and cases that could rationally be construed to be anything like this simply don't happen all that often. It's not like this is going to set off an epidemic of murder. But secondly, Tim gives you an excellent preemptive response in case. He says, look, deterrence doesn't matter because in this particular case, these people are acting in their own self-interest, trying to save their own lives. They're not going to care what would happen if they live if you're telling them that we're going to deter them into choosing death automatically, right? People are always going to choose life. The only other argument that we get with respect to direct deterrence is these people already have the taste of meat. I'm not even going to dignify that with the response. <laughs> we don't have any response to the notion of reform. And with respect to retribution, unless this is something that's wrong, unless they're robbed society in some way, I don't think retribution provides a justification either. And at that point, I can see no way to vote for it. I thank the member of government and now call upon the honorable member of opposition, Alon Kadeem, to give a speech <coughs> to the last constructive one. This August House, thanks to the side government for a really interesting case. Thanks to Dave for what I thought was a wonderful speech. These are his ninth and tenth speeches of the day. I think he deserves a round of applause just for that. Okay, I've got a couple of independent rules. First of all, they just sort of assert that Mike's better off, right? At least with the lottery, he has a chance of living. First of all, chances are, if Mike doesn't want to participate in the lottery, it's partially because he thinks it's immoral. He probably wouldn't be the best person, right? You can't necessarily presume it. Perhaps he's a Jehovah's Witness. Perhaps, you know, those people think that they're going to hell and are damned eternally if they eat other human beings, right? I think that's a reasonable thing to think that that might be the reason he doesn't want to kill someone else. Regardless, you can't necessarily assume that he's going to be eating the meat. If that's the case, whether he's picked or not, he dies. It's not like you're making him better off. Second of all, why is it important that you assume that it's in the rational person's self-interest? I think primarily it's a presumption that they have some sort of rights, right? We think rationality is important because it says someone should be able to determine for themselves rationally what's in their self-interest. That presumes that they have some sort of right. I think the right to life is in some way inviolable. And what you're doing is saying that you can impose your obligation uh, you know, to keep you alive on this person, regardless of his right to life. I want to talk about your first argument. Doesn't it make him better off, even if he believes right now that he would never eat meat, to give him the option to do so, the option of living, in case on his deathbed when he's starving, he reconsiders his Jehovah's Witness status? No. no but I think, that's I think actually the best thing to do would be to leave him out of it so that he can do his own thing. Because perhaps, for instance, he thinks he needs all of his organs, he needs all of his flesh in the afterlife, right? That way, by entering him in the lottery, if he gets eaten, that's a really bad thing for him. Bad thing for him right? You can't just presume that everyone has the same like mindset that you do, that what's in my rational self-interest as defined by you is the best thing for it. Let's go to the independent points that Dave brings up. First of all, Brian says, look, we're not necessarily saying that it's okay. Uh, Dave says, first of all, just because you have some sort of moral principle by which you're guiding your actions doesn't necessarily mean you're justified. The response is, well, we're not necessarily saying it's okay for everyone, but again, this is a difficult moral question. How many philosophers have to disagree about the question before a juror can then start to decide, well, you know, they were really trying their best, right? They were confused about it, but it's a difficult moral question. I'll let them slide, right? Do we want jurors making that sort of decision, saying to themselves, well, this is a difficult moral question, so I'll consider nullifying, whereas if it weren't a difficult, difficult moral question, I won't consider nullifying. Then he says, well, look, there's no malice. First of all, they certainly had an intent to kill Mike, right? They had an intent to harm him in some way. I think that's enough to say that they committed a crime. Even beyond that, you might be sacrificing virgins to volcanoes and not be malicious about it. You do it because you think it's good for her soul and your soul. I still think you should go to jail for that. <laughs> like, just because you have some sort of justification and you're not a mean guy doesn't mean you don't deserve to go to jail. Dave says, first of all, it's the juror's job to follow the law. Why is, the, why is it the juror's job to follow the law? Well, in part because they take an oath. In those states where they don't necessarily take an absolute oath and can go when, you know, off on their own morality, right? Perhaps in that state, it would be okay, right? But in the states, most of which you don't, you, know, you don't have that provision, where you actually have an oath to follow the law, we would argue that it's a wrong thing to do to assume that you're not going to follow the law. Then he says, look, it's an open legal question. What about self-defense? I think self-defense is a really ridiculous argument. That's why he made a joke about it. I'm going to get to that later. But again, you have to win the self-defense argument for this to work. Furthermore, he says, look, the law is not designed for this circumstance. Well, you don't want individual jurors making the determination of when the law is and is not you know, allowed to be applied in this particular case, right? It might be an aberrant like, you know, circumstance. It might be some sort of like coincidental circumstance. That doesn't necessarily mean a juror is then empowered to take that into consideration and not follow the law. On then he point. says, look, you don't want a juror to convict if the law is unjust. Do you really think a law against killing someone against his wishes and eating him is an unjust law? <laughs> <laughs> 
us to the extreme of our position, where jurors disregard all of the time. Isn't it then fair to hold you to your position, where jurors are blindly obedient to the law all the time? Pick okay. it, one or the other. Okay, so this, this, is, this is the argument that he makes sort of farther down. Uh, I forget where it is. That it's a lot better for jurors to disregard the law when they think it's you know, the moral thing to do than it is to follow the law blindly. First of all, I just disagree. There was no analysis there. You just sort of asserted this, right? Second of all, I would think that you can change the law, right? You can work within the democratic, de democratic process to change the law, but at least then all the people are represented, right? If you have a legislator do it, then everyone has a voice in changing the law. I think that's a lot better way for you to go around doing it than for an individual juror to make that determination for himself. Second of all, Dave makes the argument, why is it that the draw matters, right? They say, for social utility's sake, they can go ahead and kill them. The response we get is, well, that's an equal chance, right? Three will survive. First of all, just because it's an equal probability doesn't necessarily make it moral, particularly when one person didn't agree to that equal probability, right? But it is sort of important. They sort of gloss over that, but I think it's something you should take into consideration. Third of all, he says, look, this is not the sort of calculus we want people, much less jurors, making. The response we get is, well, there's no certainty of death in organ transplants. Well, a lot of times, if people don't get organs, it's certain they're going to die. Second of all, he says, look, Mike is better off because at least he has a chance of survival. One, probably Mike wouldn't eat the person's even if he weren't the one who was chosen. And second of all, he might have religious reasons why he doesn't want to be considered for the lottery and might want his body intact. Let's go to the case. First of all, they say, look, it's morally permissible for utilitarian grounds. They say, look, uh, basically the only analysis Brian provides here is, well, what about Jeffrey Dahmer, right? We, we obviously don't want Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, evaluating things by Jeffrey Dahmer standards, but this is a lot less like, of a clear decision, right? But that's not necessarily like arguing that we shouldn't apply the law in all cases, right? In the Jeffrey Dahmer case, we should apply the law, and here we should apply the law. You even gave us no real argument as to why in either of those cases we wouldn't want to apply the law, right? Why is it just having a justification is enough of a reason for them to say, oh, okay, then you can go free, right? That doesn't make it make any sense. Then they give you this social contractarian argument. They say, look, a rational person would agree to it. Well, I think I've given you sufficient reason why you could be a rational person, unless you're willing to say that Jehovah's Witnesses just are inherently non-rational, which I don't think you're willing to do, why a rational person might disagree with it. Even beyond that, why is it that rationality, pure self-interest, has to be the standard? Why is it we can't consider whether or not an individual would take moral considerations such as, I don't want to be responsible for someone's death into account, right? Why is it the social contract has to be entirely blind to those considerations? No reason whatsoever. The next argument is that it's an open question whether or not they did the right thing. Dave, I think, sufficiently responds to this and says, look, just because it's an open question doesn't necessarily mean the law has an open question about it, right? The law is fairly clear on the matter. They are clearly guilty by the law standards. The one way that they say they're not guilty is this idea of self-defense. Do we really want people saying that if you don't do everything in your power, you're then negligent for someone else's death, right? And then it's self-defense if you kill them. So right, so basically what that means is that if I could save 10 poor people and don't, they're justified in killing me and taking my money, or at least taking my money in self-defense, right? I'm killing them by not giving them their money. That's the justification that we use. The final argument they talk about is that there's no real sort of purpose to the law. First of all, he says, look, it doesn't necessarily happen often. But again, it's happened in this case what makes you think that it wouldn't necessarily happen in a future case? Second of all, he says, look, um, oh, yeah, like, it's not going to change your actions because what they did was saving their own lives. What Dave and I said is what they should have done is drawn among themselves, drawn among the people who agreed to be in the lottery in the first place, right? Perhaps if you, if you convict these people, you'll send a message to anyone in a similar situation, God help them, that instead of including Mike in the lottery, just draw among yourselves, right? I don't, especially if, for instance, these people get the death penalty, right? Then it certainly wasn't in their interest to include Mike in the lottery, right? You give them an incentive not to include Mike in the lottery. Finally, he talks about the idea of retribution. He says, look, retribution is not important. It's not you know, justified to punish someone just because they did something wrong. We disagree. We think that when you break one of society's laws, we think that you should be punished. Not only because it deters other people, because what you did is deserving of punishment in and of itself. For these reasons, I'm proud to have published.